Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, virtual training on the SDG indicator 241. My name is uh, Stefania Bacci. I am uh, Italian. Uh, I am a statistician working in the statistics division at FAO since uh, 2008. Uh, I started working in the SDG 241 team in early 2020. This is the second round of the virtual trainings on the SDG 241. We have indeed already carried out three very successful virtual trainings in 2020. And this year, we would like to replicate the experience. And that's why we're having other five virtual training this year. Uh, so we have carried out the first uh, of 2021, early this month with the African region. And you are now the second group of countries. We have today a record of time zones, <laughs> at least for our experience, because uh, in Cook Island, it is still uh, yesterday, actually. It is 5 p.m. Uh, of the 27th of June. So by the way, I apologize and thanks for joining on Sunday. And here in Italy, it's 5 a.m. So we have really 12 hours difference in our meeting, uh, really incredible. I must admit it has not been easy to find the proper time for all countries present today. And this is the best we could do. So before starting, let me thank deeply our colleague from the FAO Regional Office of Bangkok, Mr. Tomar Jitendra Singh, who has been precious in this coordination phase. So now let me give the floor to Aspandiar, who is the key person for this training, for the official welcome address. Over to you, Aspandiar. So thank you very much, Stefania, um, and uh, good morning and uh, um, to everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this first uh, day of the virtual training on SDG 241 amid coronavirus pandemic. This is the third in a series of the three virtual trainings in 2021, of which the first two have already been successfully organized in the last couple of months. We are foreseeing two um, other virtual trainings uh, later down this year. For this training, we are expected to be joined by um, approximately 120 esteemed officials from across Asia with representatives from 18 countries. Those some of uh, which got trained on the indicator in the recent past or have contributed to the indicator methodology or were part of the indicator testing phase. Um, my name is Arbab Aswandiar Khan, and I work as an economist uh, uh, with Statistics Division of FAO at its headquarter in, um, in Rome, and will be your leading resource person for the four days virtual training on SDG 241. Um, for this training, Stefania already introduced herself. Uh, I'm joined by her. She is the one behind making the, all the organizational arrangements for this training and will be, a, will be playing a key role of moderator during the course of the next uh, four days. We hope that this virtual training will be a great opportunity for all of you to enhance your understanding about the conceptual and methodological aspects of uh, SDG Indicator 2.4.1 and its policy use once it gets implemented. The training will be interactive uh, as we gradually in a phased manner cover the different aspects of the indicator. Uh, that is its conceptual and methodological basis, scope, coverage, periodicity, the data collection and analysis tools, and the processes and protocols and mechanisms for reporting it back to FAO. Um, as we move along, we will take several breaks for questions and discussions and try to answer and accommodate your questions that you may have. Um, let me extend my thanks to the regional statistician um, and colleagues uh, from FAO regional country offices, especially Tomar. Uh, Stefania already uh, uh, thanked him for his uh, rigorous uh, coordination in making this uh, training happen. Uh, but in any case, let me thank everyone for their gracious support in, in, in uh, in making uh, the organizational aspects of this training uh, 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 successful. We really appreciate it. Uh, last but not the least, we would like to express uh, our gratitude and profound 
appreciations to the respected participants um, who have made room in their busy work schedule uh, to attend this training in these extraordinary circumstances. We are expecting uh, an active participation and constructive discussion throughout the course of this training. Uh, so thank you very much once again. With this brief introduction, I will now leave the floor to Stefania for her to walk us through some important housekeeping rules um, that will go on this training. So Stefania, the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Ashwas Pazbandar. So let me share again my screen. Sorry, before maybe I left the share screen a little bit too much. Okay, this, okay, share. Okay, you should see now again my screen. Okay, so um, as Aspandiar said, let me immediately give you uh, some quickly, uh, quickly some few instructions that were already actually listed in the concept notes, but maybe it's important to highlight again a few. So uh, preferably use uh, a computer, a personal computer or a laptop uh, and not a mobile phone or a tablet. This is because the content sometimes could be heavy to follow. So it's important to have a big screen and also that you are comfortable in a silent place with no background noise, please, or echo. And uh, you have also a clear vision of your monitor and please turn off all the sounds notification, so Skype, WhatsApp, emails, whatever. If you have uh, connectivity issues, our boy voice breaks or the video freeze, close all the other applications that you might have open on your computer. And if it doesn't work, also maybe check through your house or your office, wherever you have, you are, if you can switch off some devices. Um, you can access Zoom from all devices via web browser or via the application, but we really say that uh, downloading the app is strongly recommended for a better experience. So also Zoom uh, regularly provides a new version of the application of the application. So it's strongly recommended to check for updates uh, to ensure that all the new features work on your computer and also to enhance the security of the application. So to do so, please go uh, open the app and click on your profile picture of the top right of the Zoom window, and then you check for updates. For a better sound quality, please do not use, if possible, your built-in computer microphone, but use a USB headset with integrated microphone or wired uh, earphone and microphone. If several participants use one unique microphone, please make sure who is speaking is close uh, to the microphone. For future use, sessions will be recorded and uploaded online on the SDG uh, webpage. So in case you don't want to show your face, your visage, uh, please keep your camera off even if uh, uh, you are talking. Uh, before going into a few rules, uh, you know that this training has been organized in a webinar mode. So we have two lead representatives per countries uh, that are more than welcome to intervene during the discussion. And these people are visible as panelists. You can see the list. But let me say that we have uh, a couple of countries, so Mongolia and Laos, that did not nominate those two lead representatives yet. So please, uh, uh, the representatives from this, they nominated from these countries, can you please write me in the chat so that I can promote uh, those two people per country as panelists. So for the two lead representatives, uh, please follow the meeting in mute mode and click the unmute button only when speaking on when or when you are giving the floor. This is because today we are more than 100 participants in total and often can help to have noises in the background that disturbs the trainers. And uh, so we kindly ask to have also the camera switched off uh, for not overloading the internet bandwidth. And you can switch the camera on, of course, when speaking, 
Uh, the two icons are visible here uh, on the bottom left of the Zoom interface. Uh, for the other participants, no, so not for the panelists, uh, you don't have the possibility to unmute or to turn on the camera, uh, but the host can allow you to do it. So this will be granted with the little exceptions. Exceptions. We apologize, but it is needful for this kind of meeting with such a big number of participants. So if you have a question that cannot be asked in the question and answer section, and you are not among the panelists, please ask for the floor and we will evaluate case by case if allowing this exception. So for both the panelists and the participants at any time during the webinar, you have the opportunity to submit your questions uh, to today's presenters. So to do so, just type your question in the Q&A section. Do not use the chat box, please, to ask questions. So you can directly write the question or you can mention that you have one and then you wait for the SDG 241 team to give you the floor. In that case, you can unmute yourself, have your video on, uh, unless, of course, you don't want to. You speak loud, please, and close to the microphone, stating your country first and then your questions. Speak concisely, slowly, clearly, and then when you are finished, you can mute yourself back and switch off the camera. You can also raise the hand virtually for requesting the floor. So look for this symbol. So there it's the raise hand function. And uh, if, if you don't have the icon in the bottom bar, you can find it in the participants menu. As time allows, of course, the presenter will address as many questions they can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So the floor will be passed to participants based on the order that appear on my screen and uh, to the extent possible, of course. And if many questions are asked, we will answer them by email. So anyway, please be ensured that we'll reply to all of them. Uh, so we kindly ask uh, uh, to renominate yourself. Uh, so please ensure that your name, the name of your country appears in the name box. So to do this, please click on the dots appearing on the right hand corner of your image box and rename and insert your country and then your last name, please. From time to time, the SDG241 team will ask questions as sort of quizzes uh, through the poll function. Uh, Please, so don't hesitate to ask clarification if something is not clear, since you will be asked to re reply to all questions. Finally, whatever issue you have, please write me. You can use the private chat, so you can change it easily in the general chat. You just need to change the recipient name to all panelists, all to Stefania Bacci, which is myself, and I will be happy to help for any kind of doubts, question, or technical matters uh, uh, that you have. Before starting, let me say that the link of the recordings of the entire virtual training will be shared with you after the third day. And we will be sending also certificates to all participants that will attend the three days. So we apologize, but we cannot send a certificate to those who will attend only one or two days. We have shared in advance all the PowerPoints, but we will share them again uh, with you after the third day, together with many other supporting documents. So that's all for now. Hope everything was clear. In case not, you know I am available through the chat. Uh, so let me uh, stop sharing the presentation and then let me share with you the agenda. Uh, okay, sorry. So share the Excel. Okay. So let's see together the agenda for these uh, uh, trainings. So today uh, we started. We start with a very intense day. We are going to learn everything about the SDG two four one. 
specifically, specifically as Van Yar will introduce us the SDG 241 and its three dimensions. So the economic, the environmental, and the social dimensions. And then we will start presenting one by one all the 11 sub-indicators. We plan to have all the economic dimension completed by today, so covering the first three sub-indicators. And after each sub-indicator presented and explained by Aspandiar, we will give you an exercise. You have already uh, actually received it uh, in the invitation email. And we will reason together on how to calculate each, each sub-indicator. So moreover, we will be launching, as I said, also some quizzes to assess if you have adequately acquired knowledge transfer during the presentation. We will do also, um, I mean, the, 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 the idea is to have also this kind of organization also for the next three days. So indicator and then exercise and then uh, quits. Of course, we will take also a 30 minutes may break or maybe a little bit less. So we will see um, during the, the training. Tomorrow, we will continue with the remaining sub-indicators. Um, I think for sure we will try, we will manage to, to cover all five of the environmental dimension and maybe one of the social, let's see. Uh, then we will have uh, uh, a colleague uh, um, um, of the AGRIS team that will present the AGRIS and 20, 50 by 2030 initiative. Uh, on the third day, we will finish presenting the, uh, the social dimension, yeah, if we need to, of course. And uh, uh, we will talk about uh, the, um, the data collection tools, so meaning the questionnaires, and uh, we will talk about the alternative data sources. Uh, then we will give, uh, uh, and then I will present also uh, the findings of the first uh, dispatch carried out last year, so the first comprehensive dispatch. Uh, and the last session will be dedicated to uh, the FAUSAT, and a colleague from our team will present so um, this presentation. The last day. We will open the day with a presentation from us, Pandyar, showing the short, medium, and long-term expectations uh, for 241. And uh, uh, then a colleague from Statistics Indonesia will present their experience. So it will be very interesting. And finally, we will open the discussion to all countries. So especially on this fourth day, uh, the lead representative will be requested to speak up and share the experience and concern on the SDG 241 data collection and calculation. So it will be a very important uh, session for us because we will be listening to you. Okay, so if you don't have any question, let's start immediately. So uh, I give again the floor to Aspandiar, who will present uh, um, the SD, the 20, the, the, we will start the presentations uh, on the SDG 241. So, Aspandiar, over to you again. Thank you very much, Stefania. So, now let me share my screen with, uh, with all of you. Stefania, can you please confirm if you can see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, Okay, so let's, let's discuss the core objectives that we want to achieve during this training. So first and foremost, as Stefania mentioned, I will walk you through the SDG 241 conceptual and methodological basis, its compilation and uh, interpretation. Uh, we will then cover the data tools and instruments developed both for collecting and reporting uh, data on the indicator. Here you will get to know about the survey questionnaire and related documents. Um, 
you will also uh, get to know about SDG 241 in the context of Agri Survey and 50 by 2030 initiative. Mind you, these are two flagship projects uh, by FAO uh, that are getting implemented in collaboration with World Bank and EFAT. However, we will discuss more about it in, uh, in a dedicated session. We will also cover the FAO data collection questionnaire as an instrument used by, by us to collect data from, from the member states. Um, we will also discuss with you the, sorry, the data gaps and uh, your concrete plans in the short, medium and long term to collect uh, data on the indicator in order to bridge those gaps and as well as um, um, final reporting to FAO. Um, lastly, an overall aim of this training is to uh, unite and assemble key stakeholders at the country level. Um, by this, I mean those uh, people or officials who are responsible for collecting and reporting data, that is representatives from the National Statistical Office, and also those responsible for then using that data for evidence-based uh, policies and decisions at the national or subnational level, that is the representatives from Ministry of Agriculture and other relevant institutions and organizations. So to contextualize, um, at FAO, we develop global public goods, that is methodologies, standards, and classifications in coordination, consultation, and close uh, partnership with the stakeholder at all levels. To give you some historical perspective, in early 2016, the FAO strategic program on sustainable agriculture and global strategy to improve agriculture and rural statistics joined forces to develop the pioneer methodology for the then tier three SDG indicator 2.4.1 to measure progress towards target 2.4. Now, as many of you may know, defining and measuring sustainable agriculture, which is a multidimensional concept, is challenging as it is complex, country specifics, uh, specific, and thus despite several attempts in the past 50 years, since 1970s, has never been done before. Um, given the multidimensionality of uh, the sustainability concept, we at FAO initiated a global discussion to deliberate the fundamental questions, that is what sustainability means in the context of agriculture, what are its fundamental building blocks, what are the economic, social, and environmental factors that affect and are in turn affected by sustainability in agriculture, um, both in an intertemporal and interspatial way. Um, you will find out in the course of this training that the methodology that we have developed to measure and monitor SDG 241 involve simple, straightforward rules to arrive at sustainability assessments of the country once the data has been collected, um, cleaned, processed, and analyzed. The approved and uh, endorsed methodology of SDG 241 is a result of a long participatory and consultative process that involved discussion with and contribution of thematic um, and subject matter experts, statisticians, uh, policy makers, and researchers from country institutions, that is uh, National Statistical Op Offices and Ministry of Agriculture, obviously, but as well international organizations, civil society, private sector, and academia. Um, on the very issue I mentioned earlier. The reason behind us involving all these key stakeholders with diverse background and experiences was to make uh, this indicator owned by everyone, um, especially countries. The current uh, methodology of SDG 241 that we will cover in detail embodies uh, the following principles. That is, it's universal, policy relevant, and practical. Um, this was to ensure sustainability of the indicator monitoring over time at the country level. Now, let us go to uh, the, the methodology itself. SDG2, Zero Hunger, has five targets 
The target that we are interested in today is target 2.4, which is written in detail here. As you can see, like many other SDG targets, this target is a very complex one. We highlighted in red some of the key aspects that needs to be captured as we try to measure progress towards this target. Sustainability, resilience, productivity, production, um, environmental considerations, that is uh, climate change, um, soil quality, etc all in one single target. Clearly, this would require an approach that captures these different dimensions or aspect of, uh, aspects of uh, the sustainability. The indicator that was uh, submitted to the interagency and expert group on sustainable development goals and was approved in March, 2015 is proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. Um, now the indicator is tier two, which means that methodology for the indicator has now been approved and endorsed. In fact, it was approved by the IAEG SDG in, uh, in October 2018. However, further require, uh, refinements were carried out in the biodiversity sub-indicator that we will cover in detail um, in, um, in, in 2019. And uh, Final approval was given by the IAEG SDG for the entire framework of SDG 241 in November 2019. Um, now, as I mentioned, the indicator is tier two. So the methodology is established, but very few data points are currently available. The formula that we propose to measure the indicator is, uh, is simple and straightforward. It's area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by agriculture land area. So let us focus on the denominator first, which is agriculture land area. It is defined as arable land plus permanent crops and permanent meadows and pastures. It's a well-known and established concept uh, that is collected by statistical bodies in, in countries and compiled internationally via a questionnaire by FAO and is disseminated through FAO stack. The issue obviously is with the numerator of the formula. How do we measure area under productive and sustainable agriculture? Now, uh, what, what is clear from the description of the target that we covered on the, on the previous slide, um, we have to look at sustainability across all its three dimensions, that is economic, social, and, uh, and uh, environmental. Meaning the agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture will, will be the agriculture area of all those farms or agriculture holdings um, that satisfy the sustainability criteria for all the uh, the sub-indicators that have uh, been selected across all these three dimensions of sustainability. Here are the steps that were used in the methodological uh, development process of SDG 241. Uh, so we discussed and chose the scale of assessment for SDG 241. And the choice made for 241 was to adopt a bottoms-up approach whereby we selected farms or agricultural holdings um, level sustainability that is aggregated at the national level. Um, we then uh, determined the scope of activities of the holding to be covered by this indicator. And the choice made for SG241 was to cover only crops and livestock activities. We then reviewed the dimensions um, to be covered and we decided to stick to the classical dimension of sustainability, that is economic, uh, social and environmental. Let me add here that in the beginning of the process, when we embarked on the development of the indicators methodology, we selected five dimension that included 
in addition to the three already mentioned, that is economic, social, and environmental, two other dimensions. Um, those were institutional or governance and resilience. However, later um, during the process, it was decided to integrate resilience with the economic, social, and environmental dimensions and drop the governance dimension as um, part of the methodology of SG 241. We are exclusively focused on agriculture holdings or farm level assessments. We then zoomed into uh, what we call um, themes or aspects within each dimension. Um, and then we selected um, the sub indicators that are needed to measure progress within, within each theme or aspect. So in total, as for the framework of SCG 241 is concerned, we have 11 themes and 11 sub indicators to measure progress within those themes. So we have three sub indicators in the economic dimension, three in the social dimension, and five in the environmental dimension. We then establish the sustainability criteria, also known as thresholds or cutoff points for each sub indicator to classify the farms and agriculture area that it owns, manages, or operates by assigning it red, yellow, and green statuses, which we call the traffic light approach. We will go through it obviously in detail as part of each sub indicator separately. Um, obviously, one other decision that we, we made was selection of the data collection uh, instrument for collecting and reporting data on the indicator, um, which was uh, preferably, um, you know, agriculture surveys or, or, or farm surveys. We also discuss uh, to decide on the periodicity or frequency for uh, data collection and reporting uh, um, uh, SG241, and it has been set at three years. So countries are supposed to uh, collect and report data on the indicator uh, every three years. And finally, the modality for reporting the indicator. For this, we develop both a dashboard where all the 11 sub indicators and themes are presented in one chart uh, where each sub indicator is illustrated separately by its sustainability status. That is the traffic light approach, which I, which I just mentioned. Um, and in aggregate uh, SCG 241, that can be calculated or derived directly from the dashboard. The principles that were used to develop this indicator, first and the foremost policy relevance, actionability. We wanted to make sure that every sub indicator selected as part of SCG 241 framework had a meaning for the policy makers and thus provided information based on which informed decisions can be taken to improve the situation on the ground meaning the sub indicators must be easily understood. Um, this was the reason why they have been selected in the first place. And once the information is collected and the results are uh, you know, derived, it, it should be easily interpreted by the policy makers. Um, for example, so you know, the policy makers should know is agriculture sustainability declining and why and which policies needs needed to be implemented to address uh, these issues. Universality and comparability are fundamental. We are in SDG process, a universal process. Uh, thus, we wanted to uh, make sure that the indicator is applicable or valid everywhere. That is, it must be relevant to all countries uh, of the world, both uh, developing and, uh, and developed. Um, measurability and cost effectiveness were very of very high importance um, in our mind as we were trying to find a right balance 
between an ideal indicator from subject matter perspective or technical perspective um, and one that can be measured consistently with a reasonable cost. So the affordability of the indicator in terms of data collection and reporting was obviously our, our top priority. So to corroborate on this very point further, uh, there are many sustainability issues or aspects but their measurement is difficult, complex, or would involve costs um, in terms of data collection, et cetera, that cannot be sustained in the framework of a regular monitoring exercise. So uh, cost effectiveness is also related to measurability. The cost associated with indicator uh, measurement have systemically been considered in relation with the accuracy and reliability of the results obtained um, um, through different measurement options. And finally, minimum cross uh, correlation uh, between, the, between the indicators. Um, so this was thoroughly discussed. Um, that is in selecting a limited set of themes and sub indicators as part of the framework of the CG241 efforts were made in consultation with the experts to reduce cross correlation um, between different sub indicators. Obviously, high cross correlation would imply that two or more sub indicators are capturing the same sustainability theme or at least issuing, uh, uh, capturing the same sustainability phenomena. In this case, the inclusion of one single sub indicator instead of several would be sufficient to adequately measure agriculture sustainability performances. Um, obviously, all these decisions in terms of policy relevance, sectionability, universality, comparability, measurability, and cost effectiveness and cross correlation had an implication uh, for the choice of the sub indicators for the different dimension the choice of sustainability criteria for each indicator and the type and level of uh, sophistication in data collection. With regards to the measurement scope, um, as I explained earlier, we are interested in assigning agriculture area sustainability statuses. So the basic unit of observation and measurement that we have chosen are agriculture holdings or agriculture farms uh, with focus only on those that primarily produces crops and livestock or a mix of uh, crops and livestock. And obviously um, the, the, the basic objective uh, behind uh, you know, us selecting crops and livestock uh, producers is to see as to whether these are economically feasible, environmental friendly and socially acceptable agriculture holdings. So we focus on crops and livestock production systems. Uh, we also uh, include both intensive, extensive and subsistence agriculture holdings as long as their primary activities as, uh, as uh, earlier explained our crops, livestock, livestock are, are a mix of both. Um, these agriculture holdings may include both food and non-food products and uh, crops grown for fodder or energy purposes. Secondary activities, this is, this is very important. Um, secondary activities are considered like say, for example, aquaculture, agroforestry, um, if and only if these activities takes place on the agriculture land area of the holding apart from crops and livestock. So the first condition uh, and the um, necessary condition for us to um, um, select an agriculture holding in, within the context or, uh, of SCG241 is to, is to focus on crops and livestock producers. In any case, if they are performing additional secondary activities, 
in terms uh, apart from crops and livestock and that those will be considered otherwise not what is out of scope holdings that are exclusively focused on on other activities uh, apart from crops and livestock that is holding exclusively focused on aquaculture or agro agroforestry as primary activities are excluded um, production from gardens backyards and hobby farms is also out of the scope of sg241 so is the food harvested from the wild um, and as well common lands that are not exclusively used by the agriculture holding for production of crops uh, and livestock and a, and a mix of both um, an important point uh, that I would like to emphasize is that um, nomadic pastoralism is also excluded from the scope of SG241. As you may know, um, nomadic pastoralism is a practice of rearing livestock by moving with animals from places to places in search of pastures. Um, in fact, it's a way of life of people who do not have um, who do not live, in fact, continually in the same place, but move cyclically or periodically um, or seasonally from one place to another. The periodicity uh, or reporting frequency of the indicator is uh, set at three years, as I explained earlier on, um, in the, on the previous slide. Uh, and this selection of three years is due to various uh, considerations. First, the SEG241 measures progress towards more productive and sustainable agriculture. And for many sub indicators selected, it is unlikely that their values uh, will change from one year to another. So these sub indicators, which you will see, uh, captures or uh, measures structural phenomena which doesn't change from one year to another, and hence uh, um, um, a more intense uh, periodicity of reporting um, is redundant. Secondly, the three-year data collection and reporting will enable countries to have at least three data points on the indicator before 2030, um, assuming that they start reporting in, in, an, in an year or two. This will in turn help countries make a historical trend to assess their performances over time and also benchmark it or compare it with, uh, with other countries or peers in the region. And lastly, and obviously, um, the three years periodicity was set to minimize data collection and uh, re reporting burden on the countries. So as mentioned earlier, SGG 241 current methodology is designed where information is collected through farm surveys, sustainability assessments are made, and final results are expressed as a national value. However, the methodology is scale independent and can be adopted for any administrative or geograph ge geographical level. Um, though, we, we understand that any introduction of additional stratification variables will certainly have implications uh, for the sample size and thus the cost of data collection. So in order to further enrich the analysis for informed and national policy making, um, the indicator can be disaggregated at a subnational level and according to the different types of um, um, agriculture holdings, that is household, non-household, um, uh, crops, livestock, or a mix of both crops and livestock, and the fact as to whether this agriculture holding is uh, using water for irrigation or not. Um, apart from that, we can further stratify the sustainability assessments, as I al already mentioned, um, at a, at a subnational level by size of agriculture holding or farm and the gender of the holder, etc. Now, as mentioned earlier, the indicator is multidimensional. This slide or, uh, represents 
a matrix uh, or a table that includes everything that we need to know about SCG241. Towards the extreme left, um, you can see that the indicator cut across the three dimensions of uh, sustainability, that is economic, environmental, and social. And within each dimension, um, we have a theme. Uh, for instance, you can see that within the economic dimension, we have three themes and corresponding three sub-indicators that are used to, measures, uh, to, to, to uh, measure the progress within that particular theme. So within the economic dimension, we have uh, land productivity, profitability, and resilience, and respective sub-indicator that measure progress within, within each respective theme. So for land productivity, we have farm output value per hectare. Um, for profitability theme, we have net farm income. For uh, resilience theme, we have risk mitigation mechanism and so on. Likewise, we have five themes uh, in the environmental dimension and three themes within the social dimension. So as I was um, mentioning earlier, in total, we have 11 themes, as you can see here, and 11 sub-indicators. Um, now, um, the original discussions that we, we, we carried out with, uh, with, the, with the sustainability experts, the list of themes and sub-indicator to measure and monitor sustainability is much longer. Um, however, there was this feeling that capturing 11 in total would be a very good step forward. One other important consideration to take note of is that we have developed, we, we had to develop, in fact, a universal framework um, so for it to be globally applicable. So a framework that covers the entire spectrum of agriculture that is confronting sustainability issues that varies from one country to another or one region to another within the same country or one type of agriculture product and production system to another. So we had to develop something, you know, that is that is equally useful and um, and uh, applicable to, to all kind of farming systems across the globe. Uh, one additional point that I would like to highlight here, and then we will later explain it uh, during my next presentation, uh, is the recall or the reference period for the for the sub-indicator. As you can see here, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, sustainability is a structural concept um, and thus would require a much longer period to assess the problem or issue and make judgment about the farm performances. So as you can see here, for some of the sub-indicators, which are more structural in nature, we have set the recall or the reference period for data collection to um, to three years instead of one year. So as I said on the previous slide, um, the hardest choice for us was to limit the framework of SCG 241 to 11 themes and 11 sub-indicators. A series of expert discussions in meetings, consultations, and literature review that we carried out have shown that sustainability is, is so complex that in general, um, a much longer list of issues are considered and used to capture, uh, capture the sustainability in agriculture. In this slide, as you can see, some issues that are considered important, but are not captured within uh, SCG 241 framework. We still, <clears throat> uh, as FAO, recommend to countries to consider these themes if these are relevant in their national or subnational context in order to assess the sustainability of their agriculture at a national or subnational level. But from, from reporting perspective, we, we don't need countries to report on these additional themes or sub-indicators. <clears throat> One uh, critical aspect that we will discuss in, in detail as part of each sub-indicator in the next presentation 
was the development or establishment of thresholds or sustainability criteria that are used to assign sustainability statuses to agriculture holdings and the agricultural land area that it manages um, or operates. Briefly, the thresholds um, are a cutoff, um, um, or the threshold of sustainability criteria are national policy-based or international targets uh, or science-based absolute or relative values or levels below or above which for each sub-indicator, the agriculture holding is assigned sustainability status. Uh, so for each sub-indicator, a criteria to ass assess sustainability statuses or levels are developed. Um, now, in order to capture the concept of continuous progress towards sustainability, a traffic light approach was devised in which three sustainability statuses or levels are considered for, for each sub-indicator. So green is uh, called a desirable, yellow acceptable, and, and red unsustainable. Um, this traffic light approach acknowledges the trade-offs existing between sustainability dimensions and the themes and the need to find an acceptable balance between them. Um, so for each, uh, so, so each sub-indicator is assessed at the level of the agriculture holding which is the unit of um, uh, observation and measurement for us. And thereafter, the sustainability level is associated with the agriculture land area of the agriculture holdings. And then, you know, um, all the results are aggregated at the national level by, by, by this traffic light approach. Recollecting from the previous slide, the reporting of SDG 241 can be done at various levels using both the dashboard and the aggregate indicator. Uh, what we require countries to report on is a dashboard and aggregate indicator at the national level. Okay. Uh, what makes the dashboard more appealing is that it helps visualize the performances across the dimension. No, uh, okay, that's why there we lost you for uh, a little bit. Uh, is it okay now? Yes. Okay. So let me let me. Uh, did you did you lose me on this slide or on the previous one? No, no, on this slide. On this slide. Okay. Okay. So I was saying that um, you know, recollecting from the previous slide, um, whereby I said that the reporting of the indicator can be done at various levels using both a dashboard and aggregate indicator. Um, at FAO, what we require countries to report on is the dashboard and aggregate indicator at the national level. Um, what makes the dashboard approach more attractive is that it helps visualization of the performances across the dimensions, as well as across independent themes and sub-indicator separately. Um, in turn, this makes the dashboard policy relevant and actionable for the decision makers, as it gives them the tool to quickly check at a single glance where the major sustainability problems lies, where to put an emphasis, what policies need to be put in place, and resources diverted or directed to address it to improve the situation and to move towards more sustainable agriculture. Now, one additional added advantage of the dashboard is that it allows the possibility of combining information from different data sources that we will discuss uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the next presentation. Um, now, to exemplify the dashboard for SCG 241, it's um, you know, um, the, the, the chart that you see here on, 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 on this slide. As you can see here on the horizontal axis or the x-axis, we are measuring the themes, the 11 themes or the sub-indicators. On the vertical axis, um, we are measuring the percentage of agriculture area or proportion of agriculture area. Now the computations and construction of each sub-indicator is carried out separately. 
um, sustainability assessments are made for each same indicator at the agriculture holding level. They are after all agriculture holding level results are associated with the agriculture land area of that particular holding. And thereafter, you know, all these results are aggregated at the national or subnational level by sustainability statuses that is red, yellow, or green. And finally reported um, in, a, in a chart like this, which we call dashboard. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the indicator is scale independent. So if the country wishes to report result at the subnational level for making informed policies, then the stratification variables or level of ge ge geographic disaggregations uh, must be planned in the sampling design of the farm survey um, beforehand for it to be able to do so. Now, the final aggregate indicator, SG241, is derived from the dashboard at the country level. Now, let me just go back to the previous slide. So here you can see each sub-indicator separately uh, by its sustainability status, um, while the final number of SG241 is the result of the sub-indicator that has recorded the highest unsustainability performance. This can be easily done either using the formula on this slide, where, whereby we identify the sub-indicator that has recorded or reported the minimum of sustainability performance, okay, the minimum of acceptable or desirable across all the 11 sub-indicators, or the maximum of the unsustainable performance across the 11 sub-indicators. Now, the performances of countries over time can be measured by the change in proportion of agriculture area that is unsustainable. So we can either track this and see over time as to whether the country has improved uh, or de deteriorated in, it, in terms of its performances over time, or conversely by tracking the value of this formula, which is uh, measuring sustainability in this case, uh, we, we are focused on tracking the level of um, uh, sustainability and we will see if the country has improved the value of this particular formula would, would increase. But going back to the dashboard, as you can see here, as I mentioned, the aggregate indicator is um, uh, aggregate 241 value is of the indicator that has reported the highest level of unsustainability or the lowest level of sustainability performances. And as you can see here from the chart, you can easily, you can easily visualize um, that in fact, indicator number two, which is, um, which is net farm income or profitability team has recorded the highest level of unsustainability or the lowest level of sustainability performance. And hence, the, uh, for this particular uh, country, um, the aggregate value would be would be forty percent for the for the aggregate SCG two four one. Now we we said in the beginning that policy relevance is uh, a very important consideration in context of SCG two four one, and in this respect the dashboard approach that we offer or we propose to countries is really interesting as um, it provides a structured and transparent framework to measure and report on sustainable agriculture. It allows focus on main issues related to sustainability and encourage decisions by linking it to policy actions. And lastly, it drives the policy towards agriculture sustainability issues with focus on intervention at, uh, at various levels. Uh, obviously, um, the dashboard approach as you, as you saw on the previous slide here is easy to interpret 
in terms of the extent to which the country agriculture is far from being productive and sustainable. And it's very easy to identify and prioritize the areas that require intervention. So as you can see here, at a single glance, you can see that in this particular country, the main issues related to sustainability are uh, within uh, profitability, resilience, and soil health themes, as well as some attention needs to be paid to decent employment. So I, I stop here. Uh, please let me know if you have any question until so far regarding the content that uh, we have uh, covered up until now. Um, Stefania, the floor is, uh, is yours. Okay, thank you, yes. Welcome back. So um, let's resume the, the training. Uh, we have seen this morning, oh, better today, because uh, it is this morning, the afternoon, and this evening, according to where you are. So we have seen the SDG 241 background, the scope, the periodicity, the levels, limitations, the policy use. Now let's move to the framework, which is the core content of this training. And we will see in details the three dimensions with all the 11 sub-indicators. As Pandyar, we show you today probably only the economic one, uh, but let's see. So oh, let's uh, uh, start again the meeting so immediately. So As Pandyar, you have the floor. So thank you very much and welcome back everyone. So let me immediately share my screen with all of you. So in the previous presentation, uh, we learned about the conceptual and methodological basis of SDG 241, that is its scope, coverage, themes, sub-indicators, periodicity and reporting, et cetera. In this session, we will go through the 11 themes and 11 uh, respective sub-indicators uh, of SDG 241, particularly focusing on the rationale for selection of the theme and the sub-indicator, the data items required to construct the sub-indicator and the sub sustainability criteria developed to assign the agriculture holding and its agriculture land area, um, green, yellow, and red statuses. So as, as highlighted earlier, SDG 241 is defined using a simple formula which is area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by agriculture land area. So let us focus on the denominator, um, agriculture land area. It is based on FAO land use classes. And as such countries provide national level statistics annually via the relevant FAO state questionnaire. So the concept is the same. Very importantly, the same land use classes are collected by census, which automatically addresses the issue of the common land. Uh, if you remember, um, we, in the context of 241, we exclude common lands from, from the scope. So in other words, the, the agriculture census uh, does focus only on farms just like 241 and exclude common land along the lines of SG 241. So we concentrate on agricultural land area, a well-established concept, um, which is derived by adding cropland and land under permanent meadows and pastures. One important point to keep in mind is that for estimation of agricultural land area, uh, we adhere to the system of environmental economic accounting, agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, and World Census of Agriculture 2020 standards and classification systems. So as you can see here, we are only interested in uh, agriculture land area. And uh, these are the classes which, are, which uh, are taken into account for us to estimate the agriculture land area of particular holding, which is, uh, which is again, let me emphasize the denominator um, of, the, of the formula. Now, 
Another important point to take note of is the land tenure of the agriculture holding um, and the agriculture land area that it's managing. Particularly from SCG2 for one point of view, the scope include the entire agriculture land area, which is um, owned and operated, okay, um, which is rented in or um, land which is borrowed for free uh, or occupied. Now, common lands, as I explained earlier, are out of the scope of SDG 241, unless these common lands are exclusively managed by the agriculture holding for its operations only. What is out of scope from the land tenure perspective is land rented out. So land owned by the agriculture holding, but if it is rented out to other farms, then it will be out of the scope of the indicator. So just as an example, um, it's a, you know, of, a, of an agriculture holding, it has four parcels of land, parcel one, parcel two, parcel three, and parcel four. Um, if we go by the explanation, which, which I just um, illustrated, parcel one uh, co consists of two fields, field one and field two and it is owned and used by the agriculture holding itself. So it will be part of the scope of SG241. Parcel two, it's also, uh, also composed of two fields. It's owned and used, so it will be part of the scope. Parcel four is not owned by the agriculture holding, but it's rented in from another, from another farm for um, agriculture activities for this by this particular holding and hence it will be considered as part of the scope of the agricultural and area of this holding. Parcel three, though it's owned by the agriculture holding, but it is rented out for that particular year or for, for an extended period to another agriculture holding. So it won't be considered as part of the scope of agricultural land area of this particular holding. So it is excluded. Now, this slides, slide again illustrate the framework of SG241, the three dimensions, economic, environmental, and social, 11 themes, 11 sub-indicators, the type of agriculture holding to which this particular sub-indicator is applicable, and the reference period, which we, which we will discuss as part of the each sub-indicator separately. So as you can see here, um, this was one of the question raised by one of the colleague in the previous session that food security um, sub-indicator is not applicable to uh, non-household agriculture holding. So, so this sub-indicator is only relevant to household farms. And, and, and in terms of decent employment, wage rate in agriculture, this sub-indicator is only applicable to holdings that are hiring um, unskilled or routine laborers. We will explain this as part of the methodology of, of this particular sub-indicator. Indicator. So before going into the details of respective sub-indicator, let me provide you with, with some generic steps, okay? Um, that, are, that, that are common for all sub-indicators and will be used to estimate each sub-indicator. One, once relevant qualitative information is collected through agriculture surveys and thereafter checked, cleaned, validated, and stored on a computer as an Excel spreadsheet or some other statistical package, it must then be transformed into appropriate quantitative variables, uh, quantitative primary variables. Data are in turn used to construct the 11 sub-indicators. So we collect qualitative information through agriculture surveys or other, other surveys, as a matter of fact, through set of questions, okay? These set of questions are then used to um, estimate uh, primary variables. And these primary variables are then used to construct secondary variables. And those secondary variables are then used for construction of respective sub-indicator. 
Now the steps are elaborated in the in the PDF file, which is which is uh, attached to uh, this slide. But however, you know, it will get clarified as we as we move along. So the first sub indicator in the economic dimension is farm output value per hectare or land productivity. The dimension is obviously economic. The theme is land productivity. The coverage for this particular sub indicator is all types of agriculture holdings. And the reference period for this particular sub indicator is last calendar year. Now, let me explain as to what we mean by farm output value per hectare. Land productivity uh, is a measure of agriculture value of outputs obtained on a given area of land for a given period of time. At farm level or agriculture holding level, land productivity reflects the technology and production processes um, for a given agroecological condition adopted by that particular agriculture holding. Now, in a broader sense, an increase in the level of land productivity enables higher production per unit of land, which is, which is straightforward, right? Now, land productivity is driven by a combination of multiple factors, which include climate, soils, topo topography, land use, and um, land management. Um, in addition, land productivity varies not only in space, in terms of all these uh, factors, which I just explained, but also in time. This variability in land productivity occurs at different time scales from seasonal to interannual in, in response to many factors of which one is variability um, in rainfall or other weather related patterns. In the context of 241, we use the same classical approach to estimate land productivity. That is first the farm output value in local currency units is estimated, which is then divided by agricultural land area measured in hectares. And lastly, the farm or the agriculture holding productivity is then compared with the farm output value per hectare or the land productivity of the distribution of agriculture holding um, to which this farm belongs to assign the agriculture holding red, green, and yellow statistics. Now, for this particular sub-indicator, um, we are interested in the following uh, data items. So let's first concentrate on the formula. So the formula is fairly straightforward. It is uh, you know, a typical formula for estimation of land productivity. Farm output value per hectare is equal to farm output value in local currency units divided by agricultural land area of the agriculture holding in hectares. So from this perspective, you know, for us to estimate the farm output value, what we need is obviously the value of output, which is nothing but physical quantities multiplied by the farm gate prices of the main crops and its byproduct produced by the holding in a reference period if this holding is primarily crop producer, five main livestock and its product produced by the holding in a reference period, if it is primarily a livestock producing holding or a mix of both crops and livestock, if it is a mixed producer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, other activities performed by the agriculture holding um, will be considered as secondary activities, if there are any. So other on-farm products produced by the holding in a reference period on top of crops and livestock, okay? What else do we need is agriculture land area of, of, the, uh, of the holding. And we define the agriculture land area, right? It's um, crop areas or arable land plus permanent crops and permanent med meadows and pastures. We further need categorization of the agriculture holdings. And this will get explained in the, in the next slide as to, as to what do we mean by that. And obviously we then need to estimate because we are comparing the farm 
the, uh, the, the given farm productivity against the um, the the productivity of a distribution of agriculture holdings to which this uh, holding belongs and hence we would need you know the farm output value per hectare for the entire distribution of farms selected as part of the of the sample so all of the information that is required for us to construct this sub indicator is in fact um, you know collected through a set of questions which are part of the survey module of SDG 241 um, that we have developed and we will show you later on. So in terms of crops and its byproduct list, I just given you an example. Uh, obviously, the list of crops would vary from one country to another and within, uh, within a country from one region to another. And, and, but this is just to, just, just to give you an example. So by no means this is an exhaustive list uh, or, or a list that FAO is recommending, but this is, a, this is just an example, okay? And, and in terms of us estimating the value of output for, for a crops, we are not interested only in the physical quantities of crops, which are, you know, which is one part of the equation, but we are also interested in the byproduct. So once the crop is harvested, there are certain byproducts produced apart from the main crop which may be of value to the farmer and he may be selling it or using it for own consumption. So from this perspective, it's, it's, um, it's worthwhile to estimate those and, and add those to the value of output. Other on-farm activities, there could be a range of other on-farm activities, uh, you know, uh, which are secondary to crops and livestock. So there could be some kind of processing going on. There could be, you know, production of uh, agroforestry products. There could be production of, uh, um, you know, other activities. Um, um, like say, for example, making hand handicrafts, training of animals, et cetera, et cetera. So if there are any other on-farm activities undertaken by the agriculture holding apart from crops and livestock as secondary activities, those, those the way their value of output needs to be estimated for us to arrive at the total value of output of the agriculture holding for that particular for that particular period. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, um, and we covered this as part of the earlier presentation. Uh, typically, for for the farm output value per hectare of or for land productivity sub indicator, it's it's um, recommended that the agriculture holdings are characterized or, or or grouped by by different types. Now, what do we mean by that? I explained that as part of the previous presentation that we could have three stratification variables. Right, one is household non household. The second one is crops focus farms, livestock focus farms, or one that produce both crops and livestock. And third one is as to whether this holding is using water for irrigation or not. So based on, based on all uh, th these three, um, um, you know, um, variables, we can, we can group the farms by different types, or we can categorize the farms by different types. So, and, and a different combination and permutation of, uh, of these variables will give us uh, different types of agriculture holdings. So let's say, for example, um, a given agriculture holding could either be household sector agriculture holding, producing only crops and is using water for irrigation, okay? So this particular category of farm is called crop household irrigate. There could very well be, you know, an agriculture holding, which is non-household, focused on crops and using water for irrigation. Okay. So this, this is another category of agriculture holding based on, based on this uh, definition. Now, remember one thing, um, why we are, you know, using this detailed drill down stratification um, variables for us to estimate the productivity. The underlying reason 
behind us having these different categories of farms is that the productivity of these different agriculture holdings um, will vary um, from, from the type of sector that this particular agricultural holding belongs to, uh, as to whether it's producing crops, livestock, or it's mix, or as to whether it's using water for irrigation. So hence, to capture, um, uh, to first estimate precise productivity of the agriculture holding and then compare it with um, you know, an, uh, a distribution um, of agriculture holdings, which are producing um, similar kind of products and is operating in similar kind of circumstances for us to, um, for us to have a reasonable um, um, sustainability assessments. So the basic idea uh, behind this is for us to compare apples with apples uh, and not to compare apples with oranges. So that's the underlying idea behind us having um, recommending, you know, this uh, different categorization of agriculture holding. So um, using this permutation and combination of uh, different, uh, you know, uh, stratification variables, we will arrive, uh, arrive at 12 different categories of agriculture holding. Now, for many countries, not, not all these 12 different categories will be applicable and that's just fine. So some countries may have uh, maybe only um, four or five categories applicable to them, but that is okay. So what then we do is, you know, um, the, um, once we categorize the agriculture holdings by different types using the, the three certification variables, we then have all the necessary ingredients for us to estimate farm output value per hectare, okay? And I mentioned to you that farm value, uh, farm output value per hectare or land productivity is simple to calculate. It's farm output value um, of the products that it is producing in the reference period divided by the agricultural land area. Now, this is, um, this is an example. Of, uh, of a typical uh, agriculture holding, um, you know, and how do we approach estimating the farm output value? So as you can see here in the formula, it's uh, physical quantities into, into prices. So uh, basically uh, let's focus on holding, holding one. Um, so the holding one produce different varieties of rice, maize, and then you know a couple of byproducts are produced um, as, uh, on top of the um, primary production of crops. Now, obviously, what we need is physical quantities in uh, in some measurable units, okay? And then the farm gate prices uh, per unit of that particular product. Now, why we are using different varieties of rice because their prices varies in the market. And hence their, the value of output of each particular variety would be different, um, you know, uh, one would be different from other. And hence to estimate uh, the accurate farm output value, it's better for us to, um, um, to have these distinguished. So we estimate the output value by crop. So we estimate the physical quantities by the farm gate prices, we estimate the farm output value, and we do repeat this for, for all the crops that the agriculture holding is producing. And then we add it up to arrive at the total farm output value. So once this total farm output value is, is estimated, all we have to do is to divide it by the, the agriculture land area, which will be measured in hectares. Now, once the farm output value per hectare for all the farms, <laughs> for all the agriculture holdings, okay, uh, that are part of the sample of that particular agriculture survey um, has been calculated. Of course, I mean, as I mentioned, all these farms are categorized by different groups, okay? So for each category of farms, we then order the farm output value per hectare from lowest to highest, okay? You can have 
four or five or six different distributions um, you know, um, for the agriculture holdings that are selected as part of the sample of the agriculture survey. So we order the farm output value per hectare or the land productivity for each group of farms from lowest to highest. Um, once we do that, we identify the 90th percentile. This is very important because the 90th percentile um, is then gonna be used for us to have the sustainability, to derive the sustainability criteria or threshold. Remember, for each sub-indicator, we are assigning red, yellow, and green statuses. So we have to do that based on, based on certain values, okay? Above or below or between which the farms will be assigned green, yellow, or red statuses. So from this perspective, let me reiterate, we order the productivity by each category. We identify the 90th percentile. The calculation of the 90th percentile is very easy. So it's um, the total number of the observation multiplied by the 90th, 90 percent. In this case, for this um, example that uh, I, I'm, I'm showing you, the 90th percentile for, for the, um, for the, this category of farm is estimated to be, the productivity is uh, um, uh, um, estimated to be 600, okay? So once the 90th percentile is identified and the associated productivity is, is marked, which is 600, we then multiply the 600 with two third and one third. These are the two thresholds that then we are gonna use to you know, basically assign the agriculture holding sustainability status. So two third of 600 is 400, one third of 600 is 200. And these are the two thresholds against which the productivity of a given farm will be benchmarked, okay? So these two thresholds, which I just explained, okay, are then used to assign red, green, and yellow sustainability statuses to the farms. And, you know, once we, once we classify the farms, green, yellow, and red, we, we then assign the same status to the agriculture area that it owns, manages, or operates. Um, so, as you can see here, the agriculture holdings will be given green or desirable status. If a given farm land productivity or farm output value per hectare is equal to or greater than the value corresponding to the two third of the 90th percentile, obviously estimated for the distribution of categories of farms to which this farm belong. Now, what do we, what do we mean by this? So if a farm productivity is above two third of the 90th percentile to the, of the distribution, then you know this farm will be assigned green status. If the farm output value per hectare is between one third and two third of the 90th percentile for that particular distribution to which it belongs, it will be assigned yellow status. And if the farm output value is less than the corresponding um, um, uh, value uh, of one third of the 90th percentile, then the farm will be assigned red status. Now, again, um, just to give you uh, an example, and this example, mind you, is um, um, some, some information or the data that we are showing you here is from the pilot tests um, that we conducted in Bangladesh back in 2017 and 18. So as you can see here, um, we collected information um, from 400 farms or agriculture hold in Bangladesh. And we then estimated the productivity of each particular agriculture holding. We then ordered the productivity of agriculture holding from lowest to highest. Uh, we identified the 90th percentile for each um, um, category uh, of agriculture holdings. And then we estimated the two third and the one third percentiles um, 
uh, of the uh, uh, two third and one third of the 90th percentile. And as you can see here, it varies from one category to another. Otherwise, we wouldn't we we we, we wouldn't have recommended you know us to have countries uh, estimate productivities by different categories of farms. So livestock household sector irrigated, the 90th percentile for this particular category is 800, two third is 533, one third is 267 and so on. So we do it for the all relevant categories to which this uh, agricultural holding belongs. Now, as I mentioned, so the individual farm productivity is then benchmarked against the one third and the two two third percentiles of the distribution. So as you can see here, the productivity uh, for agriculture holding one is estimated to be 2,900. It belongs to crop household irrigated sector. For this particular category, the 90th percentile based on the, uh, the productivities of the entire distribution is estimated to be 600. The two third threshold is 400, the one third threshold is 200 and so on. So now this is the critical area. So we then compare the individual farm productivity with these two thresholds. As we can see here, the land productivity for this particular holding is greater than the two thirds of the 90th percentile. And hence this holding will be assigned as a is green and by virtue of that the agricultural land area that this holding operates is assigned green status okay so this holding has is operating only 0.9 hectares but by by the logic that i just explained it is assigned you know uh, green status now for holding two as you can see here the threshold which i explained on the previous slide let me go back Sorry, my screen is stuck. Here. So as I, as I mentioned, so the farm will be classified as yellow if its productivity is greater than the value corresponding to one third but less than two thirds of the 90th percentile. So as you can see here, 300 is between 533 and 267, and hence it is assigned yellow status. And for holding three, as you can see here, the productivity is below one third of the 90th percentile and hence it is awarded or assigned red status. Now, let me, let me explain all these steps to you using uh, you know some some made up numbers okay um, or um, or an excel practice set that we have developed for 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 this training so let me stop my screen here and let me share with you the excel sheet Okay. So how do we go about estimating uh, no, the farm? Sonia, we see the email. You see the email, okay. How about now? Perfect. Yeah, coming. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, yes. Okay. So 
you know i in, in my in my previous presentation i was telling you about the survey module that we have developed for scg241 of course that survey module was shared with you as part of our earlier communication um but we will show it to you later during the um the sessions maybe tomorrow or day after now what is this survey module about the survey module consists of all the questions that are needed to collect information on and later construct the respective elements of indicators so in this particular exercise we will show you as to what are the questions relevant to particular sub indicator and once the information is collected then how do you use that information for you to construct the sub indicators so for the land productivity sub indicator or a farm output value per hectare we have you know uh, the following questions in the in the survey module so the first question is what was the total value of crops and its by product produced by the holding the reference period is last calendar year and uh, you know at least we 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 ask countries to at least list five main crops um, and its by product produced by the holding now these crops could either be less or more um, it doesn't matter for a given holding maybe focus only on one crop or it may be focused on on seven um that that is just fine so um irrespective of um of how many crops the holding is producing we have to list all of them in this particular case as you can see here so in this question we ask about the crop name the area that uh, the holding used to cultivate that crop the unit of measure um in terms of area the quantity produced the physical quantity the quantity unit of measure the average or the latest price per unit um, of course all these average and latest price per unit as i explained earlier are farm gate prices so we are not talking about wholesale or retail prices we are talking about farm gate prices and then you know the last column which is which is basically uh, you know um a calculation based on the information which is which is shown here now for some of the agriculture holdings they may not have you know um records of how much quantity they produce and what was the average or latest price per unit um that they were able to get for 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 the uh, for those particular products so in this case instead of asking the information about quantity produced and average price the farmer may be more comfortable providing us with the information on directly on the total value of production for that particular crop so which is just fine so in this case we won't need this information we would only collect information on on value of production but either way it's fine the more precise way is for us to collect information on quantities and the prices and then we estimate it ourselves or we ask the farmer if he doesn't have an idea about the prices and the quantities then we ask directly him about the total value of production so this is about the crops okay um so once this information is collected of course i mentioned in my in my presentation that we not only collect information on the core crops uh produced but we also collect information on the on the by products of crops so as you can see here there could very well be by products these could be named differently in your country context but that is just fine so like say for example with maize you know straw or stalk is produced with rice straw or husk is produced for cotton sticks are produced for wheat uh, stalks are produced you know it could be it could be named differently in different countries but the idea is to um capture this as well as part of the calculation of farm output value so what we again is very straightforward what we need information on is the quantity produced the unit in which that particular by product is uh, is measured the average or the latest prices again these latest or average prices are for the 
uh, or farm gate prices. Okay, so these are not retail, retailer, wholesaler, or distributor prices. And then obviously, um, the total value of production okay, of, of this particular, uh, of this particular um, crop, uh, with this particular byproduct. As you can see here, I mean, the value is not showing up, but this is total value of production, okay? So we collect information on the, on the value of crops. We collect information on the value of byproducts of crops. So let's assume for, for instance, that this agriculture holding is also producing livestock and its products, which is the scope of SDG ind indicator 2.4.1. But there could very well be the holding for which livestock is non-existent, but that is just fine. We just collect information on this and we skip all the questions related to livestock, okay? But if there is some livestock operations, then we have to consider that um, for us to estimate the total output value of livestock. Now, again, the question is, what was the total value of livestock and its byproduct produced by the holding? The reference uh, period is last calendar year. And again, just for the sake of simplicity, we ask about the five main livestock and livestock products. Th these could be more or less, it depends, right? Um, but in any case, five is a good number to, to start with. So it, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that it's collecting information on five is, is not mandatory, okay? Now, there could be a variety of different livestock animals raised or, um, um, you know, raised by the agriculture holding. It could be horses, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, pigs, depending on the country context, it, it will change. This is just a, just a list that we have provided. It could be anything. Now, what, Obviously, the, all those who are parts, part of um, estimation of uh, national accounts know that it's always better for us to estimate the, um, the balance of the livestock in the beginning of the year. Uh, and, and then what was the balance towards the end, end of the year and how much was carried forward from, um, carried over from last year and what will be carried forward to the, to the next year. So number of heads of livestock at the beginning of the year, stock plus live birth. So for horses, it's 10. Number of heads bought or received during their five. Numbers of heads given away, dead or slaughtered during their three. Number of heads sold, paid to labor, rented out or exchanged during their 10 number of heads you know at the at the end of the year is two so what we do is we take this we add this we subtract this and we subtract this and we arrive at the final value of livestock at the end of the year for for a given agriculture holding and then obviously as a second variable or that we need for us to collect data on is the average or latest price per unit, okay, of that particular of that particular um, livestock. Now, these average or um, latest prices, again, as I mentioned, um, these are farm gate and would vary from one country to another and within within a country from one region to another. So it's uh, it's uh, it's always good to to ask about the prices and not to use one average price for the entire country because that would be that would either um, you know underestimate or always overestimate the value of output for that particular um, livestock um, uh, breed or species. So then we estimate the total value of production for that particular livestock head for that particular year and we do the same for all the livestock that are produced or raised by the agriculture holding okay and again the logic is again the same so we either ask about all this information okay which is more detailed and precise um, about the quantities 
and as well as the prices, or we directly ask the farmer if he doesn't recall, if he's unable to recall all this information, then we directly ask him, okay, fine. Tell me um, what was the total value of output that you generated, you know, um, for horses or for cattle or for sheep that you are growing or raising on your agriculture holding. Now, so once we do that, obviously we know that there are certain byproducts or products that are produced as a result of uh, livestock operations on the farm. It could be horns, it could be milk, it could be fleece, it could be bull, or it could be any other thing, right? Uh, which are produced as part of the typical livestock operations. So again, we are interested in the total quantity produced for that particular product, the unit of measures in kgs or maybe liters or maybe some other physical unit. The, the selection of unit is not important um, for um, um, the, we need to be very precise in terms of, you know, uh, documenting the unit. So that should be, that should be documented properly. So uh, let's say, for example, uh, you know, milk is in some countries, it's measured in kgs, in other countries, it's in liters. Well, in some countries in kgs, uh, you know, maybe some other countries are using some other physical uh, unit of measure. What, what important is that the average or the latest prices, the farm gate prices then needed to be in the same unit, okay? So if the milk is estimated in liter, then the price should be per, you know, um, whatever currency unit, local currency unit per liter, okay? That's important. So um, we need to make sure that the quantity and the prices are reflected in the same units and the total value of production, okay? So the total value of production, again, the rationale is if the farmer doesn't have information on these, then he can directly provide us with the total value of production for the entire year for that particular product. So once, you know, information on the value of output for livestock and the value of output of its products and the value of output of crops, which I shown you, showed you about, right? It's byproducts and products. Once this is estimated, we have everything that we need to estimate the numerator of the productivity formula, which is farm output value in local currency units. Now, on top of these two um, activities, which are crops and livestock, okay, I mentioned to you that if the holding is producing um, other on-farm activities as secondary activities, then that then those needs to be captured. If you don't capture it, then uh, you know we will be underestimating the productivity of that particular agricultural holding. So let's say, for example, on top of crops and livestock as primary products, if the holding is producing, you know, other other processed, you know, agriculture commodities, like say, for example, flour marmalade, yogurt, cheese, or is practicing aquaculture, then, you know, all the quantity produce of those needs to be captured as well, okay? The unit of uh, measure should be, should be uh, captured and ask the farmer, you know, clearly. The average or latest price for that particular on-farm product, apart from crops and livestock should be captured. And the total value of production, should be estimated. And then, you know, so these are these are three questions about the, the numerator of the productivity formula that we would need for us to collect information on. Um, now, what else do we need? We need the denominator of the formula, which is the um, agricultural land area of the holding. So as I mentioned to you earlier, from land tenure perspective, um, for total agricultural land area of the holding, you know, what is in the scope, all land which is owned and operated by the holding, all land which is rented in by the holding, and other land which is occupied, borrowed for free, including common land that is exclusively managed by the holding. 
okay that's that's really the key okay so we add that up we add all these up to estimate the total agricultural land area of the whole what is excluded is all agricultural land area that is owned but is rented out okay that is not part of the scope of the holding uh, holding agricultural land area so this is from the land tenure perspective this is to make sure that we don't include the land owned but rented out so this is this is like you know a check on the on the estimation of agricultural land area from land use perspective as i mentioned to you earlier total agricultural land uh, area of the holding consists of all these categories okay which is arable land plus so all this is arable land plus permanent crops and permanent meadows and pastures okay so we need to collect information on all these and obviously this will be the same as the one captured above so from the land use perspective the total agricultural land area of the holding should be exactly the same as captured in this particular question if there is a slight discrepancy between these two numbers so the land total agricultural land area using the land question and the one is needed using the land use question then we should re ask this question to the respondent and ask him as to uh, you know uh, validate his responses now so this information all this information is collected what else do we need information on as i mentioned from productivity perspective um we we are interested in um you know having precise estimates of productivity okay because we are comparing the farm productivities again with, with other agriculture holdings okay so we need to find out as to whether this holding is this farm is household sector farm or non household sector farm as to whether this holding is using water for irrigation okay and as to whether you know it's a mainly crop producer mainly livestock producer or or a mix of both crops livestock um, producer okay as i explained to you earlier mainly crop producer represents those agriculture holding that produce crops which represents more than 2/3 of 2/3 of its total value of production it will be mainly livestock producer if the to, uh, within the total output value livestock production is is two third or greater and it will be a mix of both where when each of them represents equal to or less than two third of the uh total value of production so using all these one two three four five six seven and eight questions using all these eight questions we will be able to derive the um farm output value for for this particular agriculture holding now how do we do this so step 1 is uh, reports the data on the physical quantities and the prices collected using the survey module so as you can see here so we have the prices per unit it's mentioned us dollar here but you can use your local currency units then we have the physical quantities um, measured in um, um in, in 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 units in unit of measurement so all this information is coming from the questions which i just showed you okay so we compile this table then the next step is to multiply the prices with the physical quantities okay for us to estimate the value of production for each commodity so we do that did this for 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 all the products okay so
So we do this for individually for all the products. And then what we do is, this table is a mere repetition of the same one. The only addition in this table is towards the very end, whereby we add up all the output values for the commodities that the agriculture holding, sorry, is producing. So this is now the numerator. This is 1477 or 1477 is the total output value. Now, the second information that we need is obviously the land use. So we ask the farmer about his land use, okay? Um, obviously all these categories of land use are well explained in the methodological note as well as the support documents, okay? In the enumerator manual, um, uh, in the calculation procedures. So we have a series of support documents that we will show you. So all these categories as to what do we mean by temporary, temporary crops, you know, temporary follow, temporary meadows and pastures, kitchen gardens and backyards, all these are explained there. And uh, once the question here is administer, the enumerator need to explain, you know, these categories to the farmer for him to have a better idea as to what is um, getting asked of him. So we estimate the total agricultural land area, which is in fact, three plus six equal to nine. So nine should appear here, okay, in hectares, of course. So now we have the two numbers using which we can estimate the farm output value per hectare for this particular agriculture holding, 1477, nine. So we divide this by 1477 by nine using the formula which we elaborated in the slides to estimate 164.11. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the categorization of agricultural holding is really very important, okay? This is for us to compare likes with likes, okay? So each agriculture holding, which is selected as part of the sample of agriculture survey belongs to some category, right? Whether either it will be household, it could very well be producing a mix of crops and livestock, and it may be using irrigation or not, right? And depending on that, it belongs to a category mixed household sector irrigated and so on. So each agricult agriculture holding will belong to a certain category. Okay. So these are the list of 12 categories that I was referring to in my presentation. So you can have potentially, possibly you can have 10, you, you, you may have less, which is, which is fine. So once this is once this is done, so once we estimate the productivity for individual farm, we repeat the same exercise for all the agriculture holdings that are part of the sample. There could very well be thousand, or there could be very well be ten thousand agriculture holdings. So we repeat the same step for all agriculture holdings, and we estimate their farm output value per hectare, and then we we categorize them by the by different categories using the stratification variables. So once this is done, once this is done, if you recall, I mentioned to you then for each category, okay, we estimate the 90th percentile. We estimate the 90th percentile for that particular group. So um, um, let's say for example, this is for category two, which is, livestock household irrigated, right? So in this case, we order, you know, all the agriculture holdings with their productivities from lowest to highest. Okay. Highest. Then we estimate the 90th percentile, which we explained to you. So the 90th percentile is very simple. You multiply 90% with the total number of observation in that particular group. Okay. And it will help you estimate the 90th percentile in this case is holding number 18th. Okay. 
we then take the the farm output value uh, per hectare or the land productivity value of the 90th percentile and we multiply this 800 with two third and one third to estimate the two thresholds so we multiply 800 with with uh, two third and then we obviously multiply 800 with one third to estimate the respective thresholds and now after estimation of this threshold we have all the information that we need for us to assign sustainability status to uh, an agriculture holding so we, we then see if the agriculture holding productivity is above two-thirds of the 90th percentile for that particular group it will be assigned green status if the productivity is between 533 and 267 it will be assigned yellow status if the productivity is below 267 or one third of the 90th percentile it will be assigned red status and we we do this we we identify the 90th percentiles for all categories we estimate the two third and one third for all categories which are relevant in our case okay so this is simply the the explanation that i just gave you the traffic light green desirable yellow acceptable red and sustainable so in this case holding one the productivity is estimated to be for that particular holding 164 it belongs to mixed household sector irrigated the 90th percentile value for this particular category is 700 two-third of the 700 467 one-third is two-third 233 we compare this with these two and see as to whether it falls between it's greater than or less than and then we assign sustainability status to the agriculture holding and by virtue of that to the agricultural land area that it's managing owning or operating so in this case as you can see here 164 is less than one third of the 90th percentile and hence it is assigned red status holding two belongs to livestock household sector irrigated its productivity is between two third and one third and hence it's sun yellow status and holding five its productivity is greater than two third of the 90th percentile and hence it is assigned green status okay but we are not done there yet so we have assigned agriculture holding sustainability statuses now we have to uh, basically um, give this sustainability status to the agricultural land area of that particular agriculture holding so it's a it's a simple straightforward step whatever sustainability is assigned to the agricultural holding that is assigned to the agricultural land area of that particular holding so in this case the holding area is nine hectare it was unsustainable based on based on the logic here as you can see here yeah it's unsustainable so the same sustainability status is assigned to its agricultural land area and and so on for all agriculture holding so we then now as a last step what we do is we aggregate all the areas which are classified as greens yellows and reds okay so we add this up as you can see here the sum is 44 so we add up all the areas that are classified as green we add up all the areas that are classified as red we add up all the areas that are classified as yellow so we add those up and then we divide by the nationally representative agriculture land area collecting using the same agriculture survey for us to estimate the proportion okay so once we do that we now have the areas classified, agricultural land area classified as sustainable, acceptable, and unsustainable by sustainability statuses for the, for the entire country. And I stop here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.
<laughs> Thank you, Spandjar. We have already some questions. So the first one is, why do you adopt the 90 percentile as criteria of threshold? Oh, yes. This is a very interest, uh, important question, an interesting one as well, because we, we usually get this question quite often. So what's, what's the rationale behind, or what's the justification behind 90th percentile, why not uh, 50th percentile, right? Or two quartiles, or why not the ninth, uh, sixth decile, right? So now the selection of this particular threshold is, is arbitrary, as arbitrary as any other threshold could very well be. Um, we, we thought over as to what threshold can we use for us to assign sustainability statuses. And this was thoroughly debated with different um, experts, okay? Um, now, the, the only uh, consensus that we reached uh, in terms of um, the threshold that we have selected was was nine was the 90th percentile so this is an arbitrary threshold and um, you know your guess is as good as mine in terms of why 90th why not why not why not 80th, 80th or why not um, uh, you know 60th so this is a threshold but as long as we are consistently you know, using it across all countries for us to compare productivities of the agriculture holdings vis-a-vis -vis the distribution. Um, I, I believe we are we are, we are we are good. But this is this is let me admit this is an arbitrary threshold. You know, finalized in discussion with the experts, and later on this was um, agreed to and endorsed by all uh, all the countries, all the member states. Okay, thank you. We have uh, a question from uh, Indonesia. Uh, so in our pilot of agri-survey last year, we only collected data on individuals, so household holdings. What do you think about the 241 SDG indicator computed from the results of the pilot? Is it okay to be disseminated given we did not cover the non-household holding in the pilot? Um, I would say no, because 241, um, covers the entire spectrum of agriculture holding covering both household and non-household sector. So it depends if the non-household sector in case of Indonesia is not significant in terms of agriculture land area, if it, if it merely represent maybe like say, for example, 2% of the agriculture land area of Indonesia, then more or less, you know, you collecting information only on the household sector is, is okay. But if non-household sector or commercial sector or large-scale agriculture is a significant portion of your agricultural land area, then of course you are showing a partial picture. And any result based on those partial numbers will be misleading in terms of you representing your agricultural land area as sustainable, unsustainable, or otherwise. So I would say, um, you know, uh, if large-scale commercial agriculture or non-household sector is a significant portion of your agriculture land area, then that should be, you know, um, surveyed and, you know, information should be collected from, from that sector as well for you to have an entire picture of the, of the uh, you know, agriculture land area of the country. Okay, thanks, uh, thank you, Spandiar. Uh, just for uh, um, um, as a reminder for everybody, we will have a special uh, presentation from Indonesia on the on the fourth day about their pilots. So we can ask them all questions we want on the fourth day. Uh, we don't have any other question, uh, Spandiar. Uh, let's so... wait a few seconds. Uh, yeah, no. No question come up. Another reminder, please write your questions in the Q&A section. It will be much easier for me to follow your question. So, yeah. 
Maybe we can go, we can move on with the next uh, sub indicator. So before I proceed, Stefania, yeah. we are, we, we have 20 minutes more or less, right? Yes. Okay. So I will try to finish up the, the second sub indicator in the economic dimension, uh, which is net farm income. And then, uh, then we close for today and then we resume tomorrow. Yes. Okay, so let me share my screen. So, the second sub indicator in the economic dimension is, uh, is net farm income. Um, the theme is profitability, the coverage is all from types. And as you can see here, the reference period for this particular sub indicator is set at three years. I will explain as to why in the, in the coming slides. Now, an important part of sustainability in agriculture is the economic viability or feasibility of agriculture holdings. This is of course driven to a large extent by its profitability. Um, Within the context of SG241, profitability is measured using the net income that the farmer is able to earn from farming operations. Now, availability and use of information on farm economic performances use, measured using profitability will support better decisions, uh, both at micro and macroeconomic levels. Um, obviously, performance measures drive behavior, better information on performance can alter behavior and decision making by the government and producers, both in large scale commercial farming and medium and small scale subsistence agriculture. So this slide um, illustrates two options or two approaches that we have considered um, and recommend to countries, in fact, for them to implement. So the first one is, is a more sophisticated approach. Okay, it's more sophisticated, more data demanding, but yet more precise as well at the same time. Okay, so the sophisticated approach is more data demanding, but is more precise in terms of its estimation of net farm income. And then we offer simplified options as well. Okay, so the sophisticated option is given here. So we calculate the net farm income using the following formula. Okay, so NFI is net farm income, CR is total farm cash receipts, including direct program payments, YK is income in kind, OE is total operating expenses after rebates. This includes labor cost as well. DEP is depreciation and delta uh, inventory is value of inventory change. Okay. Now, in terms of um, us recommending the more sophisticated approach, this is basically this approach for us estimating the net farm income of a given agriculture holding is adopted from Statistics Canada, StatScan. Um, as an approach, it is recommended, as I mentioned earlier, it gives you more precise estimates. Um, however, its use at the, uh, at the country level is conditional if data on farm financial records um, that are documented on daily, weekly, monthly basis are available. Okay, so the more sophisticated approach requires some foundations, right? So if all information on all these detailed um, variables is collected, then, um, you know, the country should use this approach. Um, otherwise, they should go for the more simplified option, which I, I will explain on the next slide. The Assumption is that large scale commercial farms or large scale agriculture holdings maintain detailed financial records using which 
the net farm in can, can be calculated using this approach. Now, in terms of explanation of all these variables as to what it means and um, what does it include, all this information is given in the, um, in the stat can methodology and as well in the enumerator manual document that we have developed uh, for, uh, for estimation of, for col data collection and estimation of respective sub indicators. Now, in any case, using the more sophisticated, sophisticated approach, what do we need information on is the value of output. Now, in terms of the value of output, what does, what does it mean? It includes total farm cash receipts plus direct program payments, if any, by the government, plus income in kind of the holding, if any, plus change in inventory, uh, it could either be positive or negative. So value of output, what does it include? It includes the same variables or data items, that is the physical quantities and the farm gate prices of crops, livestock, and other non-farm activities or products. So this remains the same. Um, we need not to have additional questions for us to collect information, but the information which I showed you for the productivity indicator is sufficient for us to have information on this. Now, additional information, if it is available, then the country should use it to and, and, and uh, ad adopt the more sophisticated approach for calculation of the indicator, direct program payments, income in kind, and value of inventory change. So this is the additional information. This information already exists because we need this for farm output value per hectare as well, or land productivity indicator. And another important uh, aspect, a crucial variable, which is, which for us is needed to calculate the net farm income using sophisticated approaches, the cost, the cost of production or the cost of running the agriculture operations. Okay, so it includes both operating plus fixed plus depreciation. So in case of operating expenses, what does it include? It includes labor expenses, fertilizer expenses, pesticides, fuel, electricity, cost for feeding animal if it is a livestock farm, irrigation costs, taxes, depreciation charges, and others. Okay. So costing will, will include all these um, you know, variables. And in others, it could be rent, it could be many other things, okay? So we need total value of output, we need cost of um, producing the total value of output and using uh, a simple formula whereby we subtract the total cost from total output, we estimate the net farm income for that particular agricultural holding for that particular year. Now, as I mentioned, um, not always such detailed level information exists, okay? Um, so in this case, we offer two staggered simplified options. So the first simplified option is we collect output quantity and farm gate prices for crops and livestock and products and by products. We, but in this case, we still have to collect information on operating expenses, input quantities and its market prices. And output quantity and farm gate prices of the other on farm activities, as well as input quantities and prices utilizing production of the other on farm products. In this simplified option, which, which falls between the, the third and the first one, we exclude depreciation and value of inventory change. Okay, so in this case, we don't, cons we, 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 we don't consider these two variables. Even if this information is, is uh, hard to collect or costly to collect, then we offer a third solution, okay, which has been tested in Bangladesh as well. Where, whereby we ask respondent directly about his declaration of agriculture holding profitability over the last three calendar years, okay? And this simplified option two is part and parcel of the, um, of the SCG indicator survey questionnaire or survey module, which I'm, 
which I've been talking about throughout. So we ask the farmer a simple question, or we collect information on all these variables, which I just explained. And we ask him as to whether he was profitable in the last three years, um, or whether he was profitable in how many years he was profitable in the last three years. So whether he was profitable in one, two, or three, or none of the past three consecutive years. And depending on his answer, we then assign the green, yellow, and red statuses to the agricultural holding and the agricultural land area that it's managing, owning, or operating. So the holding is classified as green or desirable if the profitability is above zero for all past three consecutive years. The holding is classified as yellow if the profitability is above zero for at least one of the past three consecutive years. And the holding is classified as red if its profitability is below zero for all three past consecutive years. And based on the answer given to the question, we then assign the statuses to the agricultural holdings. And by virtue of that, we assign the same statuses to the agricultural land area that that particular holding is managing, owning, or operating. We then aggregate all the areas or all the agricultural holdings um, that are classified as green, yellows, and red, and we divide by the nationally representative agricultural land area collected using the same agriculture survey for us to estimate these percentages. So let me let me now give you an overview. Um, but before going there, so you may you may ask me as to why we have selected three years instead of two or one or why not more years, right? Um, now, again, the selection of three years was arbitrary, okay? This was a consensus reached with the experts, both in-house at FAO and outside experts, which include country institutions as well. So it was not that FAO was developing the methodology of SG241 in isolation, but every step of the way we were, we were involving um, key stakeholders at the national level um, uh, for us to make sure that you know the methodology is is then owned by the countries. So the selection of three years recall or reference period is is to make adequate assessment of farm profitability over an extended period to account for um, a bad year due to market failure that is low prices of outputs or high prices of inputs in a certain year or negative agroecological or environmental factors that may have negatively impacted the farm profitability that is heavy or untimely rains, floods or pest attacks. So to account for, for all these different uh, external events which are beyond the control of the agriculture holder or the holder of the agriculture holding, um, we are asking um, about the profitability for three years, not, not one year, okay? Um, obviously, if the holding is not making any profit in the past three years, this means that, you know, it shouldn't be in the business of running farming operations in first place. Obviously, the holding is, um, is, um, is not able to generate uh, sufficient uh, resources um, that can support the livelihoods of uh, its holder. Okay. So I stop here. Let me just share my screen with you. We still have eight minutes. I'm gonna show you the Excel sheet now. Okay. Okay. So in terms of data collection um, and then analysis of this particular sub indicator, I mentioned to you that we are adopting different approaches and based on the information existing at the country level, the country may pick and choose which option is best for them. 
As I mentioned to you earlier, this question in the 241 survey module is how often was this holding profitable? Of course, then the concept of profitability is explained to the, to the farmer or to the respondent, whereby we say profitable means that the value of production was greater than a total cost, either fixed or variable. And then, you know, based on the question asked, the reference period is last three calendar year of obviously. The farmer may, may say that I was unprofitable for, for all three years, profitable in one out of three years, profitable in two out of three years, profitable in three out of three years. And depending on the answer to this question, we then directly assign the farm and its agricultural land area, green, yellow, and red statuses. Now, in terms of more sophisticated approach, as I was mentioning to you earlier, some information has already been collected for um, in the, in, in the context of profitability indicators. So we need not to re-ask this question to the farmer. Those questions are sufficient. So what we need information on is total value of crops, total value of livestock, okay. total value of other on-farm production activities. Okay. So this will give us the total value of everything that is produced on the holding. What else do we need information on is the cost to produce the crops and livestock and its products and byproducts. And as I, as I mentioned, these crops, uh, these, uh, these inputs, um, you know, um, can be collected using a very sophisticated approach, asking maybe five or six questions, but this is just a summary table whereby you know, we say that apart from the total value of output, you need information on cost, that is wages, labor and kind, fertilizer, pesticide, fuel, electricity, feeding animal, irrigation, taxes, depreciation charges, others. And once you know, this information is collected, we have sufficient information for us to estimate the profitability of the agriculture holding. So all we need to do then is to subtract from the total value of output, the total cost for us to estimate the profitability. Now, in case of the simplified option, the, 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 the analysis is straightforward, okay? Um, so the simplified option is only recommended if the first two options are not feasible or if the agriculture survey is not extensive enough for it to have all these questions about the um, revenues and the cost. So in this case, the country can add just one question, um, which, which I just explained, right? So we asked the holding as to whether uh, it was profitable and this holding replied, I was profitable in two out of three years. And based on the threshold, as you can see, this holding will be classified as yellow because it's net farm income is above zero for at least one of the past three consecutive years and so on. Profitable in three out of three years, another holding, desirable, pro unprofitable in all three years, unsustainable and so on. And as I mentioned, so once we assign the sustainability statuses to the agriculture holding, we, by virtue of that, okay, using the same logic, we assign the same status to the agriculture land area of that particular holding. So in this case, holding one has nine hectares, so nine hectares become yellow um, and so on. We then add up the yellows, greens and reds. Okay. Um, and then we divide by the nationally representative agriculture land area to estimate these proportions. Now the sophisticated option. So this was a simple option, right? Just one question, get declaration from the farmer, do direct assessment, it's, it's easy. The sophisticated option, as I just explained, is, is a bit complicated. So you need to collect information on all the output value, which, which was shown to you in the, in the question here, which has already been collected for the, for, for the land productivity indicator. So you cannot avoid that. So one side of the equation is already covered. 
What else you need to collect information on is, which I just explained to you, is the cost of producing all those outputs, right? But then you need, you know, both the production and the cost collected periodically every year. Okay. So you need all these questions, you know, the three questions which I explained to you earlier, plus the costing of those questions collected every year for you to estimate the farm um, uh, profitability every year. So in year first, the total value of output was 1200, direct program payments was 170, income in kind was 100, value of inventory change was, was 30 and so on. So you estimate that using the sophisticated approach for each year. You estimate the cost each year for the past three consecutive year, and then you estimate the profitability as to whether this holding was profitable and in how many years out of three. And, and then we use the same logic to assign the agriculture holdings and its agricultural land area, sustainability statuses. And lastly, we use the same formula whereby we add up the areas classified as greens, yellows, and reds we divide by national representative agriculture area to calculate these proportions. So, so I will stop here now, just to reiterate, the sophisticated approach is more data demanding because you need to collect information on all the outputs, all the costs for, for, for each year, which in terms of questions in a survey is too much. And hence, we recommend to countries to use this simplified option, which is instead of asking information about all the costs and the outputs, um, ask directly farmer about his declaration of, of holding profitability in the last three years. So I stop here. Okay, Aspanya, do you have time to take one questions or not? Uh, yes, maybe five more minutes. Okay, so for the moment we have one question. So how to estimate on land, the parcel or plot? Um, look, for us, both are fine. Okay, so plot and parcels, both are fine. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it will be good for you to have um, estimates at plot level. But, you know, we, we don't discriminate. I mean, if you are collecting parcel level information, that is fine. If you are collecting plot level information, that is fine. The only thing is that you need to basically um, comply with the, um, you know, land use classes that we are recommending countries to follow. So, um, what I mean by that, that, you know, is we shouldn't be including or excluding the land use classes, which defines agricultural land area. So we should stick to the, to the one that defined agricultural land area as defined by um, CIA, AFF and WCA 2020. Okay, another question. Is poultry included in the calculation? Poultry, of course, will be part of the livestock because it's, a, it's, 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 it's in the livestock sector. So, so basically, um, yes, it would be. If it is major subsector, livestock subsector for the, for, the, um, for the country and it's part of the sample, yes, it would be. Okay. I think we finished the, the questions. Uh, so just one note from my side. I apologize. I realized that the panelists cannot use the Q&A section. They can, they can only see the questions. So I apologize. That's OK. So for the panelists, they can still use the chat. While for the attendees, please keep using the Q&A uh, section. 
As Panjar, we have finished the, the question. We are sharp on time. Uh, I think uh, um, so we can now close it. Of course, uh, any question that you, you, you might want to answer, the, uh, to ask about this first part will be uh, welcome tomorrow. And, uh, and uh, that's it. So let me open my video just to, to, to close the, the meet this session for today. Thank you again for having participated. And uh, um, we have already started quite intensely. We have uh, covered only two uh, sub indicators, but that's fine. We have time the next days to cover all the, all the rest. So thanks, Aspandia. Thanks, Tomar, again. And see you tomorrow sharp. We will start sharp. And uh, see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. See you tomorrow.